want you to close your eyes and take yourself back in time. The year is 1691, and you have just arrived in London. You hear the rush of the mighty River Thames and gulls overhead. You feel the cold wind blowing off the water and the rumble of crowds moving along the high street. You smell the overwhelming odor of coal smoke billowing from chimneys with falling so, so thick you can taste it. Open your eyes. You see the city of London on the opposing bank with countless new Christopher Wren churches, including the dome of St. Paul's Cathedral. The rapidly expanding merchant metropolis is rising from the ashes of a century of fire, plague, and war. And before you stands the London Bridge. Upon its strong Norman stones are countless shops and houses, many hanging meters off the side of the bridge. For the first time in over 300 years, we do not have to imagine this world. London Bridge VR is an effort by A3D History to reconstruct London Bridge and its structures in an immersive and educational 3D virtual reality experience circa the year 1691. The goal has been to rely on as much scholarship and primary sources as are available for the most accurate representation possible. Additionally, the project attempts to contextualize countless other contemporary sources and accounts of the bridge in this era. So without further delay, let us learn about the bridge. Before we begin, I want to give a special thanks to the work of Dorian Gerhold and his book, London Bridge and Its Houses. Without his scholarship and ability to compile the many survey measurements, this project would not be possible. Thankfully, his book recently received a reprinting and ebook publication, which can be found from various online retailers and is now available in the United States. If you are interested in reading more about the bridge, I would highly recommend starting there. For about two centuries, researchers have studied London Bridge. Their sources include writers, artists, and anecdotes. The first major work is Richard Thompson's Chronicles of London Bridge by an Antiquary, which was published in 1827. It was commissioned at an earlier date for the Society of Antiquaries, following Parliament's decision to tear down the old London Bridge and build a new one nearly 100 feet away. Thompson's texts provide many stories, not just about the bridge itself, but also its inception alongside the history of Southwark. I advise anyone reading antiquarian works such as this to be wary for their notoriety of promoting biases of their time as a fact. Most of the research that we might hold to a modern standard does not arrive until 100 years later with Gordon Holmes' Old London Bridge, and even later with Watson, Brigham, and Dyson's London Bridge, 2,000 Years of a River Crossing. It comes to contemporary sources from when the houses were on the bridge. Paintings and woodcut illustrations are one of our main sources. Illustrations span from the late medieval to early modern eras and include artists from diverse artistic styles. However, these images generally contain many inaccuracies. Thankfully, we now have access to numerous survey records from the City of London Corporation and Bridge House Estates, as well as numerous residence wills and shop inventories through the collections of the National Archives at Kew and the London Metropolitan Archives. Written sources like these give hard numerical figures and data, and even when those are inaccurate, they are often more correct than artistic interpretation. For creating the embankment and world surrounding the bridge, the best primary source was William Morgan's Map of London, specifically from 1682, built upon an earlier survey done by both William Morgan and John Ogilby. The wrench attention to detail and labeling allows anyone to get a comprehensive view of the layout and locations of major structures around the city. Secondary sources about London at this time are plentiful, if you are interested in a good starting point, I would suggest Leo Hollis's London Rising, The Men Who Made Modern London, 
for a very approachable overview of the city and political movements of the 17th century. To learn more about these sources and others, feel free to look at the bibliography page on our website. This is actually not the first attempt to recreate London Bridge and its houses. I was undeniably inspired by the scale model of the bridge in the Church of St. Magnus the Martyr, as well as a very dated BBC digital project that attempted to do something similar. While credit is given to these influences, neither are very accessible or immersive and lack the scholarship that has been published since their creation. Though many earlier London bridges were built by Romans, Vikings, and Normans, the longest standing stone structure was built starting in 1209 under King Henry II. The bridge saw the rise and fall of many houses and other structures throughout the Middle Ages. Around the Tudor era, most of the structures shown in this project had been built. Following the burning of the northern third of the bridge's structures in 1633, many of the houses would either be replaced or modernized to meet new fire codes as well as allow for the widening of the bridge. This earlier fire and renovation actually saved the buildings of the southern 60% of the bridge during the Great Fire of 1666. This process continued as the city rapidly changed shape around the bridge community. It was not long until the demands of the local governments saw the bridge houses as a hindrance, and by the early 1760s, all structures had been removed. By the 1830s, the old London Bridge was removed. It was replaced by the second London Bridge, which was built around 100 feet to the west. By the 1960s, the demographic shifts of London and influence of the automobile had again led the city to demand a bridge more apt for the times. The city decided to sell the second London Bridge, which found a buyer at Lake Havasu, Arizona, where it still stands today. After centuries of service, the old London bridges were gone, and we were left with the London Bridge as we know it today. Depicting the bridge in 1691 was a strategic choice. This date represents English society passing through the crossroads of the old and the new in the aftermath of its most tumultuous century. Over half of the bridge would still retain its medieval and pre-modern buildings. Some of the houses, ordered for removal circa the mid-1680s, would have remained in place for years, as tenants move their businesses and homes and demolish the structures. It is not outside the realm of possibility, then, that many of these buildings may still have been operational structures into the 1690s. The north side of the bridge stands in stark contrast. The Great Fire of 1666 established entirely new standards in the way that both roads and buildings were built. The bridge roadway would have undergone widening efforts, bringing the roadway up to about 20 feet wide. Different property developers would design early iterations of brick row houses that have since become staples throughout the city. The date of 1691 also provides a nice frame of reference. Having people relate to the sites of pre-fire London is impossible, largely because so few structures from this era remain. Conversely, by 1691, a large majority of today's notable structures were completed or under construction. These include a majority of Christopher Wren's steeples, iconic and identifiable landmarks that span all the way to Westminster. The finishing touches of St. Paul's Dome and the Great Fire Monument would have been clearly seen, as they were by far the tallest structures on the London skyline. All of these are sites that help ground us in the scale of the city at that time, as well as help us connect our past to the present. The environment on and around the bridge would have reflected the immense mercantile shifts of London as it entered the European Enlightenment. The bridge in the year 1691 was a microcosm of a much larger globalizing world, and it was a center for the textile trade. Few neighborhoods in the city would epitomize this shift in wealth from landed aristocracy 
to the Merchant Republic. The best comparison to London Bridge seems to be the Norman Bridge in Avignon, the Pont Saint-Benizé, or Pont d'Avignon. The bridge has fantastic similarities. It was built around the same time, has similar sterlings and piers, was more curved than the London Bridge, and also features a church. London Bridge was not straight, which is not uncommon. The curvature was around four degrees. Over a span of 300 meters, this doesn't sound that notable. However, it appears that the bridge made two abrupt two-degree turns at separate points. In the church of St. Thomas on the bridge, built upon the Great Pier, the stonework housed the 14 feet tall lower catacombs. This area was likely the crypt of Peter of Coal Church, the architect responsible for most of the bridge's construction and the erecting of the bridge church. This level also included a pier side entry stairwell that would only have been accessible at high tide. Speaking of the tides, the water under the bridge has also made its mark on English culture. It is said that on the eastern side of the bridge, the rapids were so tumultuous they created a weir with a two meter drop. This is supported by several contemporary accounts and the perilous attempts to cross through the arches and down the weir was known as shooting the bridge. This danger has been reported for centuries and it is said to have killed countless people. At high tide, the water would have risen to approximately where the gullet arches begin their curvature inwards. I am skeptical whether at this height, the weir retained its speed and danger, as most of the water disruption was the result of the shape and proximity of the Stirlings. In the middle of the bridge, right before Nunsuch House, there was a drawbridge which would have allowed for some larger masted barges to attempt to cross upriver. Given the width between the Stirlings, though, this space would have been quite limited. This is why most accounts show large cargo galleons conducting trade east of the bridge, often moored at Billingsgate or the Customs House. However, the west side was absolutely congested with smaller boats and barges, many acting as taxi services to the numerous stairs across the city. The layout of the houses of London Bridge have perplexed many and it is clear there are elements still shrouded in speculation. Let us study them from the cellars up. While mentioned earlier that in many cases, residents had built cellars into the brickwork, many of the other houses had hanging cellars. These would likely have been used for storage and are often quite short and thin. Built between the cellars and the ground floor, it is clear there was a series of hammer beams or strong horizontal support beams that the structures were built on top of. These beams, placed between the piers and offset from the roadway, would have massively distributed the weight of all the structures evenly across the bridge. In a later work by painter Samuel Scott, we can actually see workmen repairing the beams at low tide, a not surprising effort for those who have lived anywhere near salt water. In this and several other works, we can actually see many beams made at about a 45 degree angle, which would have helped redistribute the vertical weight into the sides of the bridge. On the ground floor would have been shops owned either by or independently of the tenants of the houses. By 1691, a large number of these would have been textile shops, commonly called haberdasheries. Other various bridge tradesmen especially those important to the early Enlightenment, were apothecaries, a clockmaker, a looking-glass maker, and booksellers. It has been suggested that unlike many shops of the time, transactions which normally occurred along roadways would instead have been done indoors in order to prevent traffic congestion along the 10 to 15 foot wide bridge. The layout in the floors above often follows a repetitive format. One would ascend via a stairway, some seemingly as thin as a foot in width, to the main hall. Above this hall was often the kitchen, which included a hanging water closet 
which would have been used for both water collection and toiletries. Above this was often an additional series of chambers or other rooms. At the top levels, we find garret spaces, often used as bed chambers for house servants. Whether these took the medieval form of large, open, lofted attics, or later as full private flats to themselves, is subject to debate. Throughout the houses, there is often mention of small houses of offices and houses of counting, standard administrative rooms or niches that in many cases may have hung further off the sides of each of the homes. In traditional medieval fashion, many of the houses would have come further out above the roadway as the stories grew higher to allow more real estate without impeding ground traffic. Some have argued that this terracing would actually hang out over the water, which certainly would have been more optimal for toiletries on the upper floors. Cross buildings were common on the latter parts of the bridge, where houses were connected by rooms covering the roadway. These occurred roughly every other building and did not encompass the highest floors. Based on estimations so far, this would have allowed an insubstantial amount of light to come down and illuminate the roadway. Although the embankment, as it is known today, was not built until over a century later, this area would have retained many familiar sites and locations. The shore of the Thames was wider than it is today. Strand Street gets its name from the Dutch demarcation used to describe the first street from a shoreline. At higher tides, the river would have risen up to the edge of what is today the far sidewalk of Tim Street. A great example of this is Somerset House. Similar to its current iteration, the Somerset House of 1691 had a garden terrace and stairs along the water's edge. The neighboring temple area similarly retains its old shoreside gardens. Some locations' names have remained, though their function and look has changed. A great example is Billingsgate. In 1691, this area was a docked inlet that was used for ship unloading. It is no wonder, then, that today Billingsgate remains a notable part of the embankment. However, there is now the iconic Billingsgate Hall built over the former inlet. Some shoreline elements are completely unrecognizable today but still have deeply rooted connections to London Bridge. The original Fishmongers Hall was housed slightly to the west of the northern bridge foot. Today, the new Fishmongers Hall has shifted slightly west of the new northern bridge foot. Blackfriars retains its historic location, complete with a train station of the same name. In 1691, it would have probably been as congested with traffic as it is today. Not because of Farringdon Road, which had not yet been built, but rather it was the connection to the River Fleet. Many small boats sailed through this area in order to connect the Thames and the northern sections of the city. Today, the River Fleet can still be heard running underneath Farringdon Road via Sir Joseph Basilgate's Victorian sewer system. I hope you have enjoyed this video, and I hope you will enjoy London Bridge VR. While it is still in very humble early stages, it is a project I would like to build bigger and higher fidelity. You can download the most recent build via the project page at a3dhistory.com. Unfortunately, much like the rebuilding of London, expanding the project will require more funding and time. I have included a link in the description to the Patreon for A3D History and would love it if you consider donating funds. Of course, liking and sharing this video and subscribing to the channel is an easy way to help this and other A3D projects remain free, independent, and academically focused. I can also be reached at the email a3dhistory at gmail.com for questions, comments, concerns, or otherwise. Again, I thank you and hope you will enjoy London Bridge VR.